Hi folks, thanks so much for joining me today. In this video, I'd like to show you how to prepare grain spawn for mushroom cultivation. This is a very, very important part of the mushroom cultivation process. And it's really pretty straightforward, as long as you follow a couple of very helpful tips, tricks, and techniques. Hack, hack, hack. Three quick hacks, five hacks. So first I'm gonna talk about the different types of grain and the general process. I'll go over what materials you're going to need. And then at the end, I'm gonna show you how to scale this process to do larger quantities of grain at a time if you were a commercial mushroom producer and you want to streamline your process. Now just about any whole unholed grain or seed will work for this process. And really it comes down to personal preference. I encourage you to try working with a few different varieties. I know for a lot of people, the biggest consideration is cost. My suspicion is that that's why wild bird seed was in wide use for some time in the early days of mushroom cultivation, but it's hard to work with in a consistent fashion and therefore I think has kind of fallen out of style. Uh, what I'm seeing most people working with these days is either sorghum, which is also called milo, or millet, which is similar. They're much smaller grains, and what that means is the mycelium can enfold the grain much more rapidly. You get faster colonization rates, and also these grains more readily absorb moisture. So um, they don't require quite as much preparation as rye. Rye is my personal favorite, and there's very little that can rival the nutritional density of rye. However, it does require a little bit more babying in the process, and I'm going to use rye to demonstrate a good way to prepare grain spawn because I think that it gives you the most tools which you can then work with your own process to kind of refine, maybe you can cut some corners. Um, rye is very dense and it does not absorb moisture quite as readily as these other grains. The other really popular grain choices are oats also because they're very cheap um, and they're readily available as animal feed grain. I do know people use wheat, rice as well. It's kind of a matter of how much nutrition you want, how much is the grain spawn contributing to the yield of your final product. If you wanna use your grain spawn in say a mycelial extract for medicine, you'll wanna use an edible grain, that kind of a thing. Um, generally animal feed grains are great. One quick side note, if at all possible, it's really important to use organic grain. And I'll dive into this in much greater detail in other videos, but uh, it's worth noting that mushrooms bioaccumulate environmental toxins at many times the levels that they are present in the ambient environment. And that means that if your grain has been treated with fungicides or herbicides, which many are, they treat them with fungicides so that fungus can't grow on the grain. Not only is that going to detrimentally affect the growth of your mycelium, but also presumably there will be toxins bioaccumulated in the final mushrooms that then you're presumably going to eat. So both for the sake of the fungus and for your own sake, go organic if at all possible. So in preparing grain spawn, there's really one primary objective. We want to saturate the grain completely with water. And at the same time, we want the outside layer of the grain to remain as dry as possible. And our third goal in all of this is to prepare the grain in such a way that they remain intact. Once the grains are exploded or broken open, sort of like oatmeal, they're far, far, far more likely to uh, contaminate with bacteria and yeast. It's very difficult for mycelium to eat porridge. It's very, very easy for bacteria to eat porridge. So those are our three things. We want saturated grain, we want dry grain, and we want intact grain. Now, there are two basic parts to this process, and neither of them is totally necessary. There's the soak and there's the boil. And that means that you can do a soak, no boil, a soak and boil, a no soak boil, and a no soak, no boil. What I'm going to be showing you is both soaking and boiling, and I'm gonna explain a little bit more about why. I don't wanna make this seem more complicated than it is. It's really very straightforward. The main thing you need to understand is that when you're soaking the grain, you're gradually increasing its moisture content. When you're boiling the grain, you're rapidly increasing its moisture content. 
If you're going to do a soak with no boiling, it's really important that you get the grain to exactly the right level of water, and you're probably going to have to calculate that. I'll show you how to do that at the end. The only one that I really don't recommend is trying to go no soak, no boil. I know it seems easier, but the likelihood of coming up with a beneficial result at the end is a lot lower. And at the end of the day, it's worth spending the extra five minutes to give your fungus a good running start. Now there's a few other things you'll need to gather. A large cooking pot, a pasta strainer, a colander to strain the grain, a long-handled spoon that lets you stir all the, way to, all the way to the bottom. The most important thing you're gonna need is your mushroom cultivation vessel. Now at some point, I recommend to everyone that they move on to using mushroom grow bags. These are incredible, they work really well, uh, but they do present some additional challenges. So um, make sure you check out my upcoming video on working with these bags, but in the meantime, I really encourage everyone who's first starting out to do the tried and true and work with canning jars. Now the idea here is that you'll be able to prepare your mushroom substrate, in this case the grain spawn, sterilize it inside of this jar, and then you'll be able to inoculate the jar through this rubber injection port and the contents will remain completely sterile throughout the entire growth cycle. The main modification here is this lid, which has a sterile injection site and a filter underneath. If you're interested in how to make these yourself, it's very easy, and there's a video on that in the link in the description. Now, mason jars come in all shapes and sizes, and it doesn't really matter what you go with. I personally really enjoy working with these little regular mouth pint jars. I fit a lot of those in a pressure cooker. Pretty much the go-to is generally the one quart wide mouth jar. A wide mouth makes it a lot easier to get the grain spawn out of the jar after it's been incubating. Usually it's too long if it's gotten into a solid brick and you can't get it out and you gotta use a butter knife and jam it in there. The problem with wide mouth lids is that they're, they provide so much air exchange that sometimes the top layer of grain can actually dry out. So you've gotta weigh the advantages and disadvantages, but just use what you have, uh, find something second hand, it doesn't really matter. Whatever you choose is gonna work. You'll also want something you can dry the grain with afterwards. That can be as simple as a regular bathing towel. Um, some people use like a screen door laid on its side or make screens specifically for this purpose. If you're feeling creative, you could build a tumbler like this one that we use for drying large batches of grain here. It's also really important to be considerate about your water. If you're on an untreated well or you have access to good clean spring water, I get mine delivered, that's ideal. Tap water will usually work but in general, if you're seeing mutations or, or poor growth, that's one of the first things that you should address. Fungi are pretty sensitive to some of the chemicals in our water, especially chlorine and bromine and the other things that we're using specifically to prevent the growth of microorganisms. The other thing you're gonna need is a pressure cooker or a vessel to sterilize your grain in. There actually is a technique for doing this without a pressure cooker, and I'll make another video about that in the future. It's called tindalization or fractional pasteurization. It's pretty successful. But most people start out with either an instant pot or a cheap Presto canner. Uh, I personally am a big fan of my antique Presto 21s. And I do a deep dive into sterilization systems and methods in one of my mushroom cultivation basics videos. So make sure to go check that out if you're interested. Our first step is to measure out our dry grain. Ready? Now at this stage, it's pretty easy to get ahead of ourselves. So there's a couple things we need to keep in mind. First of all, sterilization is usually the bottleneck. So we want to avoid cooking more grain than we can fit into our pressure cooker. You'll have to see what you have and how many jars you can fit and then calculate it based on the volume. A standard Presto canner usually fits seven one quart mason jars. We also wanna make sure we leave enough room in the jar for the grain to be shaken around after it's cooked. Rye and most other grains approximately doubles in volume after it's been hydrated. So, to fill our seven one-quart mason jars, we would want to weigh out a little less than three and a half quarts of grain. Obviously, it's more efficient to do this in batches. However, there's another thing to consider, which is that if we add too much grain to our pot, it will actually take too long to come to a boil, and in that time, the grain will overcook. For the most part, it's easiest to estimate measurements based on volume, but it can also be helpful to write down the exact measurements, partly to help keep track and refine the process, and also because it'll help you scale up later on, which I'll explain at the end of the video. Next, we'll add enough clean, unchlorinated water to completely cover the grain. 
Remember, it nearly doubles in volume, so you want to add enough that as the grain expands, it won't push itself up above the surface. Stir to release trapped air and any other debris that might float to the surface, then cover the pot and allow it to soak. Now for the boil. Boiling the grain is not so much about cooking it as it is A, trying to get it up to full moisture saturation, and B, trying to get it hot enough that once we strain it, we can allow the steam to evaporate off the surface and create that dry, fully saturated grain that we're looking for. The more quickly you boil the grain, the better, so put it over the highest heat burner you have access to. Once it's at a full rolling boil, it won't need much time. We want the grain to be cooked a bit like al dente pasta. If you look closely, you can see that the outside of the kernels is translucent, but there's still a little raw, crunchy bit in the middle. Tasting it is a great way to familiarize yourself with the different cooking thresholds. As soon as it's ready, strain your grain through a pasta strainer or colander. Let it drain completely, and then spread it in a thin, even layer across your towel or window screen. Exposed to the air, the hot surface moisture on each kernel of the grain will evaporate quickly as steam, leaving a dry outer surface with plenty of moisture still trapped inside. Fill your jars about three quarters of the way full to leave plenty of room for shaking and mixing the grain after inoculation. Next, put on your filtered injection port lids, leaving them a little bit loose for the sterilizer. If possible, it's always best to avoid putting sealed vessels in a pressure cooker. It's also a good idea to cover each of the jars with a piece of aluminum foil. This adds an extra layer of protection, especially when you're unloading the jars from the pressure cooker and allowing them to cool. Pressure cookers will always come with some kind of rack or spacer to keep the contents from touching the bottom of the pressure cooker. It's also helpful to keep the jars from resting in the boiling water. So I usually modify my pressure cooker racks with some one and a half inch stainless steel carriage bolts to give them a little more space. This also allows me to add plenty of water so I never have to worry about boiling it dry. Always be sure to add at least the minimum amount of water recommended for your pressure cooker. This is usually about two quarts. As you load the jars, double check to make sure that the lids are still loose. Heat the pressure cooker on high until it's releasing a steady jet of steam. This usually takes about 15 to 20 minutes. Okay. Add the shaker weight on the 15 PSI setting and bring the cooker to full pressure. Turn it down and try to find the sweet spot where it maintains pressure but only rattles and releases steam intermittently. Set your timer for 90 minutes and keep an eye on it as the grain sterilizes. If this is new to you, make sure to take a little extra time to learn how to use a pressure cooker properly. Read the instructions and check out my video on the subject. Once the time's up, turn off your pressure cooker and allow it to gradually cool back down to atmospheric pressure. Always be sure to let it depressurize to no more than 2 or 3 psi before moving a pressure cooker. Always remove the shaker weight to make sure that the cooker is completely depressurized before opening the lid, and use some silicone mitts or tongs to unload the jars. As the pressure cooker cools, the steam inside will condense back into water and will eventually begin drawing in unsterile outside air. This is why most mushroom cultivators will cool and unload their pressure cookers in front of a sterile air filtration device called a laminar flow hood but it isn't necessary for this part of the process. For best results, 
you want to open your pressure cooker as soon as it reaches atmospheric pressure. Then tighten down the jar lids and allow them to cool. Of course, this means that you need to be especially careful not to burn yourself. At this point, the jars should remain completely sterile as long as the lid remains unopened. Okay, so now that we have our perfectly prepared grain spawn, we're ready to inoculate it using a liquid culture syringe. Liquid culture is by far the easiest, most accessible, most reliable, and most consistent way to start your grain spawn. Make sure to check out my video on how to use a liquid culture syringe for more information about the inoculation process. As always, visit us at the Fungaya shop for all your gourmet and medicinal mushroom needs. And make sure to visit our partners at truebluegenetics.org for a huge selection of the most consistent, clean, vigorous liquid culture on the market. Use the coupon code FUNGAIA at checkout. Be sure to mix the jar as thoroughly as possible after inoculation to distribute the liquid culture throughout the grain. Taking a little extra time to do this now will save you the need to break and shake the mycelium later. Not only does this save you work, but it's also beneficial for the fungus and it cuts down on your incubation time. All you have left to do now is sit back, relax, and watch it grow. We'll let this grain spawn incubate for usually about a week to three weeks sometimes, depending on the species. And it's pretty cool to see the mycelium slowly expand, envelop each of those grains, and you can see how then they each become kind of like a seed or satellite colony of that fungus when we add it into the next stage of our cultivation process. Incubate your grain spawn in a warm place away from direct sunlight. As it grows, you may notice untouched patches of grain. More often than not, it's necessary to mix the grain spawn at least once during incubation. Each time you do this disturbs the mycelium, so it's best to avoid doing it more than necessary. Break up the mycelium by knocking the jar against your palm or something like a stack of paperback books. Then, once most of the grains have been loosened from each other, you can mix them thoroughly by gently rocking the jar back and forth and twisting it at the same time. Once the mycelium has completely enveloped the grain, it's safe to handle in the open air and ready to be used to spawn into your bulk substrate like sawdust, straw, or manure. We've got lots more videos in the works, so stay tuned for more information about these final steps and many other aspects of the mushroom cultivation process. So make sure to follow along and check out other videos upcoming. If you're interested in liquid culture of any of your favorite gourmet and medicinal varieties, check out the Fungaya shop. And I also really recommend that you check out the sponsor, True Blue Genetics. They not only have an unbelievable selection, they're the most consistently clean, reliable source of vigorous LC that I've found. And I think that they're also one of the most affordable. If you use the coupon code Fungaya at checkout, you'll get 20% off. And it also goes a long way to help support trying to bring accessible, free mushroom cultivation education to everyone. Once you've gone through this process over and over again, it'll start to get a little bit boring. So you'll have mushrooms coming out of your ears. So you're gonna to wanna to streamline this process. And this is especially relevant for people who are interested in commercial mushroom cultivation. So as we dive into some of the specifics of that, I'm gonna pass the torch over to my friend, Professor Sporadicus. Thanks so much for watching, folks. Mycelium. So what we showed you so far was the soak and boil technique. Now what I'd like to show you is how to do a soak no boil technique specifically for rye. I think for some of the other grains you can actually get away with just soaking them, but rye on its own won't absorb enough water without the heat unless you calculate it exactly. So that's what I'm going to show you how to do, and this is the process that you'll want to use if you're trying to produce grain spawn at scale. But it's gonna involve a little bit of math. So the idea here is we wanna come up with a consistent proportion that we can use to calculate all of our future batches. That way we don't have to cook the grain every time. If you're trying to produce grain spawn at a larger scale, this becomes really cumbersome and you need a lot of space and a lot of time to do it. The way that I'm gonna show you will allow you to create many, many back-to-back -back batches, but it's really, really important that the moisture be exact. So. To figure out our baseline, we use the proportions that we weighed from that first batch. So we take the total wet weight of the cooked grain, we subtract the dry weight of the grain that we put in, and that'll give us the total amount of water that we added to get it to that point. In this case, we started with 
2,100 grams of dry grain. And we ended up with 3,631. Pull out your trusty calculator. And that gives us a total water content of 1,525 grams, which incidentally is about one and a half liters of water. So now we'll calculate our baseline ratio by dividing the total dry weight of grain by the total wet weight after we've cooked it. Now that gives us an approximate ratio of 0 0.58. So now we can use this magic number to determine exactly how much dry grain we need to add to exactly how much water to figure out a total amount of grain that we want to, to make. So it's going to be easiest because of the way that water weighs exactly one gram for one milliliter to measure your water using the metric system. So let's say we want to produce roughly 10 pounds of grain spawn. We'll call that about 5 kilograms or 5,000 grams. Now that's the total wet weight of the grain that we want to make. So what we need to figure out first is how much dry grain we want. So we'll put in X for our total dry weight. And we know that that's going to equal our ratio here of 0.58. Now all we have to do is cross multiply, and so that's 5,000 times 0.58, and that will give us x equals 2,900 grams of dry grain. So first we'll weigh that out, then we'll soak it overnight. And at the end, we'll weigh it again and figure out how much more water we need to add in order to get it up to our total 5,000 grams. Okay, now that we've soaked our grain and weighed it, we can plug in these numbers and figure out the rest. Okay, so. We started out with 2,900 grams of dry grain, and we want to get up to 5,000 grams total. We're pretty close after the rye was soaked in water overnight, so we only need to add a little bit extra water to get it up to that 5,000 grams. Now, this is a pretty simple process to figure out because we simply need to subtract this from this. So, in all of that grain, we're only short 342 grams of water, which, remember, is the same as 342 milliliters. But we're not all adding this to one bag. So we need to evenly divide into our different bags. Now, I personally think that a really good proportion is somewhere between 1,500 and 2,000 grams per bag. That's about three and a half, four pounds. So in this case, I'm going to play it a little safe and make some smaller bags, and we'll make them 1,250 grams each. Now remember, this is the total wet weight of the grain. So we've got to add a proportion of our soaked grain plus a proportion of water to each bag in order for them to come out to the exact amount that we want at the end. So that means we need to divide the soaked grain quantity and the water quantity by our total number of bags and carefully weigh the grain and measure the water into each one. So now we know that all we have to do is add an exact proportion of dry grain plus a little bit of water to each bag, and we'll get back to the exact same ratio that we got to when we cooked the grain and prepared it really carefully, laying it out on the towel and figuring out our proportions that way. 
And this means that once the steam penetrates those bags, the grain is going to absorb that remaining water inside of each one of those bags. And the final result will come out looking almost exactly the same as the grain that we prepared very carefully in the time-consuming fashion I showed you before. Now, many of you are probably wondering why I don't just add the grain and the water straight to the bag without soaking it, or why we don't just add the water to the bag and soak the grain in there and then put it in the pressure cooker. I've come to this process through a fair amount of trial and error, and I encourage you to experiment on your own, but here's the main problem. When you soak the grain overnight, it expands. As it expands, it pushes itself up above the level of the water in the bag or the jar or pot, whatever you're soaking it in, and the results that you have dry grain sitting on top that hasn't absorbed enough moisture. Then, when you go to put that in the pressure cooker, and this is also the reason I always soak my rye first, it's forcing steam into those grains at such a high rate that it actually ends up blowing them up and they break open and you end up with a lot of porridge or oatmeal on the top of your grain spawn. Another problem is if you're using really fresh rye, it will actually start to germinate, which isn't necessarily an issue for a growing grain spawn, but the germinated grain is a lot more prone to exploding in the pressure cooker as well. So, from my trial and error, I've found that soaking the grain is the best way to make sure that it gets fully saturated, and if you want to skip the boiling, you're going to have to do a little bit of math. Now I simply measure the remaining water into the bags. I fold them loosely so that the grain has plenty of room to expand in the sterilizer. I sterilize them for a full two hours, and then unload them hot. I like to draw in some air before sealing the bags, which helps a lot with mixing the grain spawn later on. I seal the bags under laminar flow, and then set them on the shelf to cool. I usually try to wait a few days before inoculating the bags to make sure everything is good to go. When you're working at this scale, you may want to consider buying your liquid culture in bulk. I've developed a unique method for packaging bulk liquid culture in sterile medical IV bags. This system allows my commercial clients to produce their own grain spawn at a fraction of the cost of using individual syringes or buying bulk spawn from a producer. We've got a lot cooking for you over here at Fungaya, so turn on channel notifications and stay tuned for upcoming videos about this and many other exciting innovations, including the debut of Remus our remarkably efficient mass inoculation system. I'm so grateful that you took the time to watch this video, and I hope to catch you on the next one.